go far with go far lessons from the past um, the sort of idea behind it is actually a crazy one it all started when um, with something which we can in, in German call a schnapps idee and by the way uh, apologies for the accent um, there is that crazy idea that was sort of come into existence with Dan Kahn, uh, some other more crazy people in our industry, some of I have yet to, to meet in real life. Hi, Lisa. Um, and by the way, if you don't follow Dan, uh, please do so because he is definitely way younger than I am and much cooler. It's real. <laughs> so quite often we think that problems we face are new and, and unheard of before where in reality they have been around for decades and to see the approaches of how they're going to be solved or how they were tried to be solved can help us to approach them today and for that um, I have one thing prepared which is also on Twitter if you go for uh, the hashtag go for it or for Daniel or mine Twitter account you can see that challenge in terms of when was this message creating a simple yet secure cipher by which means messages can be sealed when was that um, sort of coined when was that um, used in in the sense and I'll sort of reveal that secret at the end of the show um, computer security so there have been the usual issues before before Windows 98, by the way, and, and um, worrying about a computer breach is not the only one. And the risk for cyber attacks seems to be on the rise still. Uh, and by the way, uh, shame on anyone who thinks evil of it that I am putting cyber risks and Windows in the same picture. Uh, enjoy your next LAN party, <laughs> if you do one. The document pictured on the right has some interesting stuff in it. The chapter is, or one chapter is titled Automated Decision Making Applications Continue to Make Bad Decisions Until Problems Are Corrected. So anyone who doesn't think of big data algorithms here, we'll, we'll see. Another one reads as criminals exploited weaknesses in basic management controls. Well, I do wonder uh, what uh, why is that phrased in the past tense? They still do, I think. One more to mention. Management does not place sufficient emphasis on controlling systems. And that document is from June 1976, uh, where there's a subparagraph in that management did not ascend, assess potential threats to the systems. Yeah, 50 years back. The full document basically lists all we have, all, all we face still today, sorry. Um, and quite likely, the following is still true in terms of manipulation of input, interception of communication systems. And that's, again, 1975. We have all this stuff in here, which we are facing as of today user security the next element yeah? computer security is now more important than ever come on 1979 we have 2022 and that can be the same headline for today safeguarding computer files and the the interesting things here are in this one and in this one statistically the most serious problems in the computer room our data processing and operator errors. Huh? Insider threats, whatever you want to call it. The user in itself. Therefore, user security. Or safeguarding the files. When you think of it, and it's uh, probably hard to read for the guys on, on, on here in, in, in real life. Maybe uh, online can read it better. It's referring to a movie we have all seen, at least I have seen when I was young, War Games. Yeah? 
safeguarding computer files, and that actually is a letter from a reader to that um, to that newspaper asking whether these things are taken care of. Yeah, one safeguard users can apply is a password. Here we go, passwords. The interesting one is here. Um, Despite the numerous accounting and other rigorous controls that characterize the paper environment, users were inclined to say, if there are any security problems, presumably the data processor, nowadays called the admin, will take care of it. So what we read in this year and what we have all still today is, I think, what Douglas Adams called a, a, a SEP field someone else's problem. Now, I don't care about it. I don't see it. I don't want to take care of it. It's not my business. Taking me to, and we're talking about users, identity theft. Uh, users, passwords, we all have that. Justice Department in November 1974 talked about it in relation to um, social security numbers yeah? and it's again a revolving topic we have the same thing in 1998 and the same thing in 2005 and still today you can find organizations out there that are using in the US social security numbers or whatever kind of easily f falsible identifier for users that leads to when we're talking about users, that leads to data security. ID theft is usually something which happens on, la on a larger scale with we're talking about identities taken away, initial access brokers. These are sort of the current phrases of problems they were facing 50 years ago. Where, yeah, now you usual suspect, again, SSNs, July 77, report cites danger of a, of a privacy breach, where in the same way the experts claim to have plucked the gap leading uh, to a computer breach. It's related, and it's the interesting finding here is this gap, I'm afraid, typically of the kind of human error that renders ineffective even the best designed safeguards to contain uh, contained in automated data systems. Again, uh, users versus technology. On the right hand side, you have another document talking about data security from the 70s. Access controls, flow controls, inference controls. Now, you can think of that in terms of, okay, inference controls, access controls, top type of input. Now, what about website security? These fields and forms we have. It's all there. If you put this into the element of, oh, it's down here, sorry. Maybe we can change that a little bit. Give me a second. when you do your last minute changes to the slide deck. <laughs> there we go. Should be there now. Equity funding. Are there any members of Isaka here around? Or have you heard about Isaka? That con uh, that um, group of information security professionals. Equity funding scandal in the early 70s was about generating false IDs to have um, insurance policies assigned to these false non-existent IDs and then they were using to resell these false sh security policies to the back insurer and made money out of it and it was the first time that the idea of auditing information um, s processing systems in the financial area and that was actually the, the, the initiator, the spark that created COBIT. Yeah? Uh, COBOL, sorry. Um, 
and the uh, Isaka, which is now called, was then founded by that way on the end. So if we put these things together, that's a handwritten note on a document. That note is from 1968, when I was uh, nine months old, not years, thank you. <laughs> um, the attached description represents an incomplete effort to sum up the, the computer security problem areas. You can go through. User identification. We heard of it every day. File integrity. Next topic. Sanitation of so storage media. Um, you can go through. Uh, classification of information. Access to computer operations. Communication security. Uh, the interesting part, spillage inadvertent dump. That what they called foreign access. An inadvertent dump was someone retrieving the data without an authorization. Uh, so, we, as shown, we have had all these issues 50 years back, 60 years back. And what we still do is we try to remediate by tech. And we have tried that for many years. Um, the, the, admittedly, the business is good. No? We all learn, earn, earn our money from that. But the element here is, and I think it's time to broaden the view a bit here, is about what is the influence tech has on risk. Uh, going back to 1938, and we're talking about the car technology here, not your Merck. Better brakes will reduce the absolute size of the minimum stopping zone. Is it true? But the driver soon learns that this new zone and since it has its field zone ratio, which remains constant, he allows only the same relative margin between the field and the zone. In essence, what that is in that plain old English is the better the brakes we are, the later we brake. And that study or a similar study was replicated in the late 80s early 90s back in, in in my home place in germany i'm not living in munich but that was carried out in munich where a, a couple of taxis were equipped with um, um, anti-lock brake systems and the other ones hadn't the effect was that they were monitoring while they were monitoring the taxi drivers those who knew that they had abs installed they were riskier in their behavior and their driving behavior so Whenever we have a compensating technical element, our behavior turns, tends to get riskier. Um, when you look at, and, and the same is, is true for newer cars. Um, my one is five years old. Maybe I'm kind of risky in my behavior. This is uh, an excerpt from a study done in Norway Newer cars are generally more comfortable, car, uh, causing less noise and vibration. They are also, in general, pictured, promoted, conceived as technically safer. It is possible that drivers take advantage of that perceived safety to adopt a less defi defensive style in driving. So, transfer that. Password policies. Uh, do we have to change every 30 days, every 90 days? Does it make us safer? Or is it creating a riskier behavior by our users? And uh, you can take that. And um, by the way, what it introduces is that case against commercial antivirus software risk and homeostasis, which is the theory behind risk homeostasis and information problems in cybersecurity. I will come to that because now it's also time to wrap up. But I want to leave one thing here. Another tech solution. Will it make us safer? I don't think that. We will see. So talking about risk management. As I mentioned, the idea or theory be, is called risk homeostasis. And what's behind is 
basically it transferred a little bit. An organization is, in essence, a group of people where each person in it has an individual risk level. A level of acceptance of risk, a risk compensation level, and that's a dynamic balance, according to the theory, between that perceived risk and the security felt, which seems to impact to be impacted by the level of security provided. So the user behavior, if I have a very strict risk and uh, security environment, might even become more riskier. Uh, combine that with the SEP field mentioned before, and you know what I'm talking about. So the in person, an individual, is that base identity, and our risk management needs to incorporate that one. And now, by the way, I've provided with the with the final slide, if you take it from there, and I'll share it, all the links to these snippets from the from the past and also to the studies and everything. So um in that sense, the perceived security protection as an enabler of a riskier IT behavior, I leave that as a question for you, as a takeaway for the lessons. And now I see I have another issue here on my slide. As I mentioned before, don't work last minute on your slide sets. One lesson from an old guy. But it should work anyway. Uh, hang on. So, lessons. Uh, that's a part here. Is there a full sense of security in all the effort we have put out into the technical measures, into controls? It seems to be. Don't take me wrong. Do we have to throw away the tech? No, certainly not. Because it will help us to reduce our attack surface, then the only thing we have to do as a lesson is to do better and to do, to do different. And the one thing we need to do is talk about cyber resilience, the measures behind implementing security controls embedded into our business process, embedded into or aligned to our user behavior and the task we have with our users. And as it has been documented already diversity and inclusivity it cre reduces our risks by 50 percent uh, and the last one here an all-girl computers environment is not a bad thing but I want you if it's one lesson you take away from us today the diversity element of having people from different places in your teams, whether it's non-IT or IT, is really helping you to reduce your risk behavior. Because people tend to talk about it differently. And group thinking, like Phil Ingram mentioned it, will not happen in that sense that we are reducing our sort of risk awareness by simply saying, yeah, everybody else doesn't think it, it is a risk. Yeah. Be diverse. And then the side effect is we don't think of that as a speciality anymore because, again, such a headline can also be up to date. Thank you. Any questions? Sure. Hi, yeah, I have a question. So you talked a little bit about um, AI and whether or not it can make you more secure. So I have a question that's maybe a bit of a nasty question, but when we're developing technologies, perhaps with the good intention of them helping make us more secure, how much responsibility do the innovators need to have in thinking ahead of what happens to that technology as it develops? Because we've seen this happen with blockchain, we've seen this happen with Web3 or happening with Web3. So my question is kind of like, how do we build in both security and I guess privacy to some degree into the tools that we're innovating? Well, the First of all, it's not an easy answer to find here. Um, what I would start with is 
if we develop a security tool, keep the user in mind. What does it do to the perception of risk for the user? Now, if we deliver that message again and again, yeah, we'll, we'll make you 99% sure, <laughs> safe. <laughs> Don't talk about 100%. Um, the perception we create is I don't have to care about. And that's the element that needs to be sort of changed. Ubiquity of, of computer devices. Uh, how many smartphones can I find here? Probably 20, even more. Whatever kind of communic is, is kind of communicating with the internet, with the public internet, has that element of risk in, in embedded into it. And that is the moment where we say, okay, if I do develop something, whether it's AI-based, ML-based, whether we call it Web3, which I highly doubt about any security issues in there. <coughs> Sorry. Um, we have to keep in mind that if the perception we create is, I don't have to care then we're making something wrong. When th then it's a full mistake. And that's the part, probably the, the, the short answer to your question, Lisa. Keep that in mind. Make sure that the, the need to care about is not diminished. Any more questions? Just yell at me, come on. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Um, so, in the early in the talk, you had like quite a lot of snippets from 1968, some even earlier. Yeah. Kind of explaining that at that point, you know, security was thought about, at least, maybe not implemented, but certainly thought about and how they can yeah. circumvent that. Whereas, when I started in the industry uh, yeah, 10 years ago, there's a lot of people that weren't very aware that were developing this. How, how yeah. do you think that that mismatch kind of happened? I and mean, isn't that then making the whole thing very risky from a management point of view that these mm -hmm. lessons aren't being learned even when they were thought of? Well, I, I think I've mentioned two elements that play a, a role in here. Uh, number one, it's not my problem. Yeah, that it's the data processors presumably taking care of that. Um, if we have... And this, this is the way the whole IT started. Now, it started as a small group somewhere down in the cellar, um, probably not often let out to see the daylight or whatever you want to call it. You all know these stereotypes. Um, but they, the, part of that stereotype is a truth that I don't understand. It's not my business. It's their job. So we have that someone else problem field that why should I care about it? And that is, is one element. The other element is um, probably a, also a generation ash element. When I started in IT <laughs> ages ago, um, we were keen on learning that stuff. How does it work? Yeah. Like you did in your talk, break this thing apart. Nowadays, we don't do that anymore. Yeah. We don't look behind it. We don't dare to question it. And that's another element. One more? <laughs> does anyone have a last question? One more. Oh, one more. There we go. As a, as a follow-up, you yeah. were saying that it's a shame that we can't break into things, and I agree with you on that. Mm -hmm. What do you think, how can we make things better so that they can be used? Do you think it's uh, the ability's not there, or do you think that it's actually um, that the, 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 the want is not there anymore? Um, for uh, the, the, the want, I think... The want can be cre created if we start talking about, if we look at risky behavior from that, do you know what happens? 
Yeah? If you're using your smartphone, and I'm, I have to admit, I'm doing that much to their delightment with my kids. What's behind? Did you question that? And that's one of the things we, we have to, to promote, I guess, in, in schools, in, 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 in forums like this, whatever kind of element is there. And, and I once had a, um, a teacher of my, 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 one of my sons was like, hey, can you pass by to school and give a, whatever it was, a two-hour session. And if you have some old tech, bring it along so that we can really break it apart. And they were coming in with screwdrivers and whatever and opened up the desk or the, 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 the box of a, of a laptop, pulling out the screen, whatever. Um, I didn't bring along a CRT, but <laughs> that would be risky. Um, but that's the thing. Yeah? Stay curious about how these things work. It's one element. The other element is simple push it. Change the mindset by talking about it. Be more resilient in that sense. Fantastic. One more question here in the audience. You said that diversified teams yes. show 50% less risky behavior, yes. right? Isn't that a crucial danger for being innovative to show 50% less danger? Because to be innovative, uh, at some point we have to take some risks, right? What are your thoughts on that? It's, it's sort of the, 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 the counterpart to, to the question that um, Lisa Forti just raised. Um, on the one hand side, yes, Innovation means to take risks. Do you take risk at all cost if you want to innovate? And that's the point. If I am willing to take a risk to innovate, to become a founder, to you do a startup, to think of a certain s a problem in a different way and to provide a solution, it is taking a risk. The element of that is if you do that without any sort of how to say that, um, control in, in, in your own way. Okay, if I do that, what happens in the aftermath? Yeah? If the solution you provide as the innovative solution, and we can take the, the, the flipper zero as a sort of not perfect example, yeah? it's, an, it's a versatile tool. The way it can be used can be dangerous. How do we overcome that? So the idea of doing the flipper zero is not bad. It's quite innovative. Yeah? It's helpful in many aspects, but it has side effects. And if you have that diversity in your team, you have a greater chance to overcome that group thinking in terms of uh, that's a, a side effect we don't have to talk about. It will never materialize. Or we don't even think about that potential side effect. Well, I think that closes off the talk. Uh, we'll be back in 30 minutes with a talk about hacking one's brains. So tune in for that. Long list of sources. See you.